Good afternoon. In this video, we will examine why inflation is bad. Let us start by defining inflation. Inflation is the percentage increase in the overall price level. In general, inflation is considered a problem, not only by economists, but by simple people too. But why is this the case? If the prices of everything I buy increase overnight by 10% due to inflation, then this is definitely going to affect me negatively. But my salary is also a price, the price of my labor. So if the 10% increase includes my salary and also all other sources of my income, like rents, freelancing income, etc., then my purchasing power still remains the same. Therefore, the effects of inflation are not real, they're only nominal. This means that inflation should not be that bad, in the sense that it's not a societal problem, but rather a problem of numbers. There are several problems with this argument. First, not all prices are flexible or free to change. There are several prices that are stuck, at least for the short run, because of contracts, agreements, or other commitments. Second, even prices that are not bound by contracts and are flexible to change, they do not all change at the same rate. For instance, if two goods have different price elasticity, their prices will be affected differently by inflation. Do not forget that the inflation rate is the percentage change of the overall price level, is therefore an average of different price increases. Third, prices of goods and wages often change out of sync. This means two things. A, wages usually increase less than the prices of consumption goods, but also B, the increase in wages lags behind the increase in prices. Fourth, payments sometimes are scheduled for after the sales. And the later a payment is received, the more its value will depreciate due to inflation. Fifth, the mere process of changing the prices creates serious administrative issues, difficulties, and financial costs. Therefore, inflation causes economic distortions that lead to societal problems. Let's examine those one by one. The first societal problem is the distortion in the distribution of income. When prices go up, not all incomes catch up at the same rate. A dentist, a hairdresser, or a masseuse can increase their incomes instantly because they just update their price list and their revenue is automatically increased. A secretary, a teacher, or a pensioner, on the other hand, cannot renegotiate their incomes instantly because their wages are bound by a contract or require the government to change them. This creates relative purchasing power shift to the benefit of groups who can readjust their incomes, such as freelancers, contractors, or entrepreneurs. This means that inflation makes hired workers and pensioners relatively poorer than freelancers and entrepreneurs. Now, theoretically, this is only a short-run effect. As we have seen in micro, in the long run, contracts and commitments expire at some point, and incomes will be able to catch up with the rest of prices. However, if inflation persists, which is the most usual, salaries and pensions will always lag behind prices, meaning that till wages catch up with the past price hikes, prices will have increased further, creating a permanent lag between the two. A second drawback of inflation is the worsening of the economic environment. Economists have observed that moderate amounts of inflation may be beneficial for business. This is because Firms can adjust their revenue by increasing prices, but do not have to adjust salaries to their workers. So revenue increases, cost remains constant, and this can boost profitability. When inflation gets out of control, however, it creates risks and uncertainty that by far outweigh the benefits of mild inflation. First, cash reserves depreciate in value because that's what inflation does. Firms routinely hold cash reserves waiting for the appropriate investment opportunities. When, however, firms see that inflation eats their money as the clock is ticking, they may rush to investment projects that would not otherwise choose. Second, prices of imported inputs may skyrocket. This is because the domestic currency loses value while the foreign currency usually is not. So prices of imported goods in the local currency will rise steeply. Third, Credit may become more expensive. Banks usually increase the loaning interest rates above inflation 
in order to cover potential losses from even more inflation in the future. This makes the access to credit and investment more expensive for firms. Fourth, consumers may reduce consumption of some goods and their demand may crash. When cash loses its value rapidly, consumers tend to buy more durable goods, which tend to devaluate slower than cash does. As a result, the demand of perishable goods and services may decrease during periods of high inflation, causing serious problems to those industries. Fifth, established collusion may collapse because of the constant price changes. If, for instance, we have all agreed to charge 10 and there is around 50% inflation, some may increase the price to 15, but others to 14. So some firms may undercut not by cutting prices, but by increasing them less than their competitors. Now, the collapse of collusion hardly is a societal problem. Yet, the instability that causes it is. All of the above hurt the economic environment and discourage growth. Inflation also distorts credit relations. When inflation is unanticipated, it may hurt the creditors. Let us see an example because this is usually a hard concept for students to grasp. Assume that Colin loans $100 to Dylan and according to the agreement, after one year, Dylan will return $108 to Colin. Let us also assume that inflation during this year is expected to be 5%. From this loan, Colin will receive $8 of interest. This $8 covered two purposes. First, a part protects Colin from losing value due to the expected inflation. For instance, with the $100, Colin could buy today 10 pitches. Because we are in Singapore and you must pay $10 for a pitch that in Greece would cost only 20 cents anyway. If Colin next year received only $100, he would not be able to buy 10 pitches because the price of pitches is expected to increase by 5% to $10.50 because of inflation, which means that he could buy only 9.5 pitches. So he would lose half a pitch because of inflation. If, however, he receives back $105, he can still buy the 10 pitches and he's protected from inflation, at least from the anticipated portion. Notice that in this example, Colin does not receive only $105 after a year, but $108. What about the three remaining dollars? These are intended to compensate Colin for foregoing the opportunity to use his money for an entire year. This part has nothing to do with inflation. It's a compensation, a payment, a fee for the inconvenience that the creditor will have no access to his money for the time of the loan. And I repeat, it has nothing to do with inflation. It would be there even if inflation was guaranteed to be zero. Now, it is easy to understand that if actual inflation turns out to exceed 8%, Colin would lose value from the capital. That is, he will not be able to buy 10 pitches after a year because their price will exceed 1080. Still, I want you to notice here that Colin would lose even when actual inflation turns out to be between 5 and 8%. Let me show you why. Say that inflation turned out to be 7% instead of 5 that we expected. This means that Colin would lose $7 of value instead of 5. So he has a $2 excess loss due to the unanticipated component of inflation. Now, the $8 of the total interest cover this loss. Yet, he was supposed to receive $3 for the inconvenience, and now he's receiving only one. This entails that Colin is foregoing producer surplus in this transaction, so he is still losing. Therefore, the message of this slide is that creditors lose in any case if the actual inflation exceeds the anticipated inflation, even marginally. Another issue is that inflation creates administrative costs which require firms to allocate resources in order to deal with them. For instance, it is required to dedicate workers' time, effort, other resources, and financial costs to constantly recalculate and change prices. Imagine that you have a small convenience store that carries more than 4,000 codes and you need to reprice and retag all those items every few weeks. Moreover, it is costly to constantly reprint menus, catalogs, and advertisements, to constantly recalculate financial obligations, or to constantly be in a race to get rid of cash before it devaluates. 
or to spend money on lawyers for writing contracts with suppliers in order to control the increases in the price of your inputs. All those entail serious financial costs for the firms and are usually known as menu costs. At a macroeconomic level, menu costs waste a significant part of the labor force and capital in the economy to handle these inefficiencies instead of producing real output. Inflation also distorts competition. Large companies can easier deal with the cost of inflation than smaller firms. For example, suppliers will not bother signing contracts for fixed prices of inputs for small quantities that smaller firms usually buy. Also, it is not worth for smaller firms to invest in automation for price changes because they do not have the volume of sales to cover such fixed costs. Or smaller firms do not have access to financial analysts to assess inflation or to optimize their cash flows. So they end up holding more cash than optimal and lose value due to inflation. All of the above distort competition to the detriment of smaller firms, which often results to smaller firms going out of business or being absorbed by larger firms increasing the concentration in the industry. A sixth problem of inflation is that it affects consumer choices. When prices change constantly, consumers may lose track of relative values. For instance, when income is $50, the price of rice $2, and the price of chicken $6, a consumer will go through the normal utility optimization process that we know and may decide to purchase 10 portions of rice and 5 portions of chicken. If, however, inflation changes the price ratio, and while income remains $50, the price of rice increases to $3, and the price of chicken rises to $11, the consumer will have to change the ratio of rice and chicken he buys. Therefore, we say that inflation causes consumers to alter their consumption choices. All previous costs of inflation cause a climate of general dissatisfaction to voters of countries with high inflation. So governments are often tempted to use policies in order to curb inflation. At a macroeconomic level, contractionary monetary policy is in general effective in reducing inflation. This is straightforward as contractionary monetary policy is based on reducing the money supply, which makes cash scarcer and naturally appreciates its value, counterbalancing inflation. Yet, contractionary policy causes also something else, contraction. So it typically results in unemployment. An example of this was the Great Britain in the 80s, where the controversial Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher applied contractionary policies to lower inflation, and she succeeded it. So the British were happy that the pound became stronger, but also unhappy because they had no pounds and no jobs. At a microeconomic level, inflation can be fought with price controls, such as price ceilings for necessities like bread, milk, butter, etc. Nevertheless, as we have learned in microeconomics, Price controls bring serious side effects with them, that is, inefficiency in terms of dead weight loss, shortages of output, and they naturally tend to create black markets. So, now you know why inflation is generally considered negative. Comment your questions below, smash the like button, subscribe with notifications on, and as always, thank you for watching.